for the third part in this series on quality and patient safety for the master series I'd like to talk a bit about performance improvement in quality and patient safety. This builds on what I have already put out there around the need for some infrastructure and I recognize that may vary from hospital to hospital and about value because ultimately being able to improve how we perform is the important ingredient in quality and patient safety. We talk a lot about trying to achieve high reliability and I take this pyramid as part of how we think about doing that. If you start at the bottom and work up, it's about setting goals, having good performance and accountability to that. Uh, and uh, that's what I did touch on a little earlier. It's about the leadership commitment. It's about having a culture of safety and then it's doing the performance improvement to lead to a safe, highly reliable care. It was interesting, this is a pyramid that Joint Commission put out uh, about a year and a half ago. And as I thought about it, I adapted this slightly from that. It's how we at the Cleveland Clinic have been building our programs the last four or five years. So I like this sequence of building a fairly logical approach to how we set about trying to create high reliability, which is being driven largely by performance improvement. So in performance improvement, it is about this identifying your gaps. Back to something I said earlier, if you don't measure, you can't manage it. So you've got to look at your data, you've got to see where you have opportunities for improvement. Having done that, it's then setting the goals, designing and executing projects, reviewing that progress, transitioning the work. You can't own that work further. It's taking it back to the front line. They own it at the end of the day. They do the work with you. You help them do the work. And then it's support and accountability at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the day. And you need to help them set that up appropriately. This is a very busy slide, but I give it to you in concept. Uh, this is how we set quality goals at the Cleveland Clinic. And if you look at the left side of this, you'll see three main domains, safety, quality, and patient experience. My belief is we've got too many measures on this scorecard at the present time. And this year we'll probably cut back a bit. <clears throat> but from some of the things we talked about in the value uh, session, you'll see patient safety indicators, hospital-acquired infections, and some of the things that appear in the other value programs, the process measures, core measures, readmissions, mortality, and then the patient experience measures, which have been HCAPs, the hospital one, but are now going to the ambulatory ones. So we have deliberately chosen measures that are important on the national scene. Uh, but just having measures isn't good enough. I think it's really important for this column on the right that you set very specific targets. I didn't really understand and believe that when I first started doing this kind of work, but it does help because this gives your leaders, that leadership commitment, something to use and show on a regular basis. When our CEO gets up looking at these with the specific goals and targets, people pay attention. When you use these scorecards for review, we have quarterly reviews here at the clinic, people pay attention to the things that are on this scorecard because they know they're going to be held accountable to them by our executive leadership on a quarterly basis. I'm not going to go into the details of these, but I give you this in the concept of having domains, specific measures, and then very specific targets as you set your quality goals. Having some framework for continuous improvement is, I believe, important too. And those of you who have more scientific backgrounds rather than performance improvement backgrounds, don't panic. That's where I came from. I used to run big national trials and things. It's the same stuff. This is the academic, the scientific method in a different guise. It's about setting goals, setting projects, and driving on through. So it's set the goals, measure performance, improve, reward, and recognize this culture of performance improvement. On the improvement part, it's about having a structure. We're not a lean or a Six Sigma uh, or a specific thing. We use all the tools depending on the projects, but de define, plan, implement, and eh, it didn't work right, recycle that one a little bit, 
And when it's complete, transition the project to the real owners. Don't own them long term. But you've got to make sure that they get to the point that they are uh, in an appropriate framework for that transition. So having some structure there and some thought about how we drive in performance improvement is important. And I've been doing this about seven, eight years. This works. Another important concept within this is the whole project management aspect of performance improvement. And you'll see the uh, triangle is kind of inverted here deliberately because really all performance improvement ha happens at the front line. Those closest to the work have the best ideas of how to drive improvement and they need to own it. But leadership has a key role in helping prioritize, support and engage the front line. And this really is the framework for servant leadership. And this is how we have tried to drive a lot of our projects in our performance improvement work. Don't underestimate the power of the front line. They can really make things happen for you and with you. As we think about projects, another important concept that we've found is having an appropriate team structure. For all of our hospital level or health system level projects, this is what we do. We have a clinical lead partnered with a project manager. Uh, physician, we use a lot of physician leads, but they may be nursing leads. It needs to have the right clinical input. Now we all recognize they are busy people. So giving them the structured support with project management really builds a fairly strong and potent team. And then you bring in the appropriate uh, other support personnel and stakeholders that you need for the specific project. So the clinical need needs to have the expertise in that space. For example, if we're looking at VTE reduction, uh, you want someone who really understands the field of venous thromboembolism and pair that with a project manager uh, who keeps them on track, doesn't let them stray, you don't start scope creep, all those kind of things can drive projects off the ladder. And the project manager, uh, we've got a group of project managers I love working with because you can't escape. Uh, they make sure the work gets done. So what are the elements of a good project and a good plan? It's defining you know, what will be done and when it will be done, a start and an end time to it. Projects should not be open-ended. It's tracking the progress and we have regular uh, meetings. We meet and look at all of our projects on a monthly basis. And most projects we will review each month. Depends how mature they are. But we do these huddles around our projects where the uh, leads come with the appropriate stakeholders. So we track what's really happening with them. And as appropriate, start looking at the data and make sure they are staying on track. That's my responsibility as a leader in this space is to know what the menu is, uh, but to know the status of those projects. At a high level, I try to stay out of the weeds, uh, but make sure that we have clear goals uh, and timelines and are staying on track. Uh, and who owns it? Uh, these are the questions I will ask. Uh, how do we manage to get that done? Let me give you an example of a project. Uh, we've said quite a bit about hospital-acquired infections. And Central line associated bloodstream infections uh, have been a bit of everyone's problem across the country over the last decade. So really in looking at that, we found that we had rates above the national mean. Uh, and everyone said, well, we got sicker patients than everyone else. You know, we can't do anything about it. We said, oh, yes, you can. Uh, so it took a little uh, buy-in to do that. But we set a very specific goal to reduce the rate by 25%. And that meant a very specific target of getting to less than one such infection per thousand days of having a central catheter in for 2013. So this was a broad level goal, the 25% reduction, uh, the reducing to one per th less than one per thousand days, a very specific target we uh, set to get to. How do we set about doing this? It was about the project team uh, training those who have these patients. It's about standardizing practice. This is about reducing the unnecessary variability. Does the patient need a catheter? 
How's it put in? How's it maintained? Is it taken out as soon as you can take it out? The things that are obvious about trying to reduce infections associated with these. There's nothing magic about setting these projects up. It's about setting up some standardized systems. And in this case, it was having bundles of care, everyone doing it the same way. Not the nurse having to think, this is Dr. So-and-so, he does it this way, Dr. Y does it a different way. That's when you start to get into trouble. So it's standardizing the methods as uh, it was really the whole project plan. The data was collected by our infection prevention team. All hospitals have, are required to have some infection prevention surveillance. Uh, and these are data that you have to submit nationally. So really people couldn't argue with the data that was being collected and being used to drive the project. And review of this, when it's an enterprise level project for us, is at board level, executive level, and local level. I guess I should say the other way, local, executive, board. But I did it that way because it is important that the board understands this is a problem. And you can say this about many of the hospital acquired conditions at the present time. And then the whole accountability part. If you do all of these things, you have the evidence, you have the data, it then becomes easier to hold people accountable for their performance in these projects and in uh, reducing these rates. This is what happened. What I didn't show you is what it looked like two or three years before, because this started off the top of this graphic uh, uh, back in 2009. We had rates that were up in the three to four per thousand catheter days. So we were already coming down. As you can see, last year, 2012, we had an upswing here. And this was, we'd been doing pretty good. We got down here. But this is the reason we reset this at less than one per thousand nine days, knowing that we'd had some issues last year and some changes in our patient population, certainly. But again, uh, I would like to set a target that's more aggressive than this for a project like this, because the national mean actually has dropped, because everyone's been working on this, and the national mean is now down at around 0 0.6, 0 0.75. So we've got more work to do. There's always more work to do. The reviews of these projects uh, are important at all levels. And as I intimated earlier, doing this at trustees, at executive leadership, hospital level, us institutes rather than departments, we work in disease-based institutes. And then the local review is everyone looking at the data and where there are gaps, are they doing something specific about it? Uh, and we really have worked hard to do those kind of reviews. So really the whole performance improvement activity depends on all the things I've talked about. Having some infrastructure there, but really setting, identifying your gaps, setting goals, and then having accountability performance around the projects driving those goals is key. The leadership commitment, I've said it many times, and I'll say it again, you can't do this if your leaders aren't on board to help. The whole culture of safety is about thinking differently. Uh, it is about a culture. I have worked hard with our group to stop talking about a culture of safety, but rather just talk about a culture of the hospital as a whole. And I think our employee engagement activities, our uh, patient experience activities, safety is part of just that whole big picture. So we are very much working on culture, period, thinking differently about how we deliver health care rather than just thinking about a culture of safety. And I've challenged my group in particular to think about that bigger picture. And then the performance improvement things we just talked about are key in driving that change. And with that, you start to move really to this highly reliable care from a patient perspective. If you're not getting better, you're not doing the right things. And there's always an opportunity, no matter how good you are, to continue to improve. So really, in summary, uh, what I see for quality and patient safety in 2013 are these things. First of all, it is important to all caregivers. Everyone owns this. Everyone needs to be thinking about it. And I can tell you a decade ago, we weren't like that. I would like to submit that uh, in 2013, the Cleveland Clinic uh, is like that. All caregivers do think about these things. One needs to understand the scope of what you have to do and have some infrastructure to help support that. Having content experts there is important, and you felt that, I hope, in some of the 
things I said around what's happening on the national scene, what we need to know about to be able to drive and focus where the activity needs to be. But those content experts rely on getting the right information to the local owners of quality and safety. These are the people who make it happen. Can't overemphasize, frontline is the site of improvement. And creating value in this space is hugely important, driving it through performance improvement. And it's all about the patient. We may talk a lot about the regulatory things, the things we're required to report. And if I sit in a meeting and I, that's all I hear, I will stop it every so often and say, what about the patient? And really when you come back to it, all the things that are on, on that agenda really are about the patient. But if there's a question how we do something, I do ask whoever's talking, if you were the patient, what would you want them to do to you or for you? And that often changes the tone of those discussions. So keep it central around the patient. That completes my series on uh, quality and patient safety for this master's series. Thank you.